Hello, beautiful souls. My name is Carolyn and I'm abnormal. This channel is about true crime, conspiracy theories, and anything abnormal. Thank you so much for clicking on this video and I hope you're having an amazing day. Let's get into the story. In 1993, 41-year-old Valerie Pape was living in New York City. Valerie was described as a very petite woman. She only stood five foot two. She had blonde hair. She weighed about 110 pounds. And she was described as very sweet, caring, loving, and very gentle. She was an immigrant from France. And she was working, taking care of an elderly man named Howard Pomerantz. Working for Howard, she met his son, Ira, who was a 54-year-old that was the complete opposite of Valerie. Ira was a 54-year-old brash New Yorker who was loud, outspoken, and when he was in a room, you definitely knew it. Valerie was beautiful. She was always meticulously dressed. She took great pride in making sure her hair, her makeup, her clothing was all perfect every time she went out. And it wasn't long before Ira took notice of Valerie. The two started dating and everything seemed to be going great. On November 18th, 1995, Ira and Valerie got married. Valerie wore a gorgeous gown and she was given away by a close friend, Michael Savage from France. Both Valerie and Michael, having both immigrated from France, were very close and had a very tight relationship. That same year, they moved to a posh neighborhood in Scottsdale, Arizona. Valerie really enjoyed the year round warm weather and soon the two were quite well known in social circles. Ira opened two bars close by in Chandler, Arizona. At this time, Valerie was going to beauty school. In 1997, with the financial help of Ira, Valerie was able to open her own beauty salon. And Michael Savage, the man who had given Valerie away, had followed the couple to Scottsdale, Arizona. Michael worked at the salon, answering the phones and taking reservations. To keep up Michael's immigration status so that he could stay in the country, Valerie listed him as one of the owners of her salon. Now, I don't know about you so far in this story, but I'm a little curious as to what exactly is the relationship between Valerie and Michael? Because Michael's always around and Valerie always is willing to do anything to help him out. They did both immigrate from France, so that was something they had in common. Their relationship was extremely, extremely close. And this was definitely something Ira was well aware of. Ira was always described as a very good man, but he had a temper, he had a drinking problem, and it did not bring out a good side of Ira. In 1998, he was arrested for a DUI, and he was definitely not known for being a very good businessman. He was notorious for not paying employees, overcharging for drinks, watering drinks down, and not obeying laws. And he was running two bars. Ira was eventually fined by the Liquor Control Board for serving drinks to underage people and for also serving drinks after hours when he was not, no longer allowed to be selling alcohol. With unpaid bills and business going badly, Ira lost one of the bars and the second one was soon to follow. And in 1999, Ira was in the process of filing for bankruptcy. It wasn't helping financial matters that Valerie had grown very accustomed to living a very lavish lifestyle. She drove a brand new Jaguar and always had the most expensive designer clothes. That was the only type of clothing that Valerie would wear. The couple argued often about their dwindling finances and Ira had a very hard time controlling his temper. Michael Savage, who was very close with the couple, ended up moving in with them. Michael was a constant third figure in their relationship, and he was extremely close to Valerie, never leaving her side. On top of all the money problems, Ira became very suspicious that Valerie and Michael were having an affair. 
Ira told his friends that he could not keep up with Valerie's extravagant spending and he was planning on filing for divorce. The arguments between Ira and Valerie got so bad that Valerie decided to take self-defense courses and learned how to shoot a gun in case she ever needed to protect herself. Ira had a very large collection of handguns and Valerie had stated to a number of people that she was very afraid that Ira may use one of those guns on her. In September 1999, Valerie really needed to get away from Ira. Valerie and Michael moved in with a close friend of Valerie's named Merle. But Merle was having all kinds of problems of her own. While Valerie and Michael were staying with Merle, Merle reported her husband as missing. Not long after, Valerie and Ira reconciled and Valerie and Michael moved back into the home with Ira. However, just a week after they had moved back in with Ira, Merle's husband, Ron Bianchi, was found murdered. Once back home, the conflicts continued and Valerie at one point accused Ira of, in the middle of a heated argument, running into the kitchen, grabbing a whole bunch of kitchen knives and started throwing them at Valerie. Ira denied the allegations, but Valerie was granted an order of protection and Ira was forced to move out of the home. Within a few days, Ira had violated the order and Valerie had called the police. But a week later, the two had reconciled and Valerie went to the court and said that she had received apologies and she wanted to drop the order against Ira. Ira moved back into the home. During the 1990s, the police were called to the home many times for things ranging from aggravated assault, burglary, and violating a protection order. But in the early hours of January 28, 2020, 25 miles away from Scottsdale in Meza, Arizona, a truck driver was dropping off a 5 a.m. delivery. He found it odd at that early hour of the morning to find a blue Jaguar parked out behind a grocery store. The truck driver watched as a petite blonde woman wearing high heels, gloves and sunglasses and a jumpsuit opened her trunk and took out a large object wrapped in plastic. The tiny woman struggled to lift the plastic package up above her head to place it in a dumpster. The delivery driver found the entire thing so bizarre, he took down the license plate of the Blue Jaguar and watched as it drove away. After the car was gone, the man drove over to the dumpster to see what had been placed in the dumpster. He opened up the plastic bag and could tell it was a large piece of some part of a human body. He immediately called the police and when the police arrived, they uncovered a male torso. The head, arms and legs had all been removed. When investigators ran the license plate, it came back to Valerie. Valerie was working in her salon when the police came in and arrested her. Everyone at the salon was shocked. They couldn't believe someone as sweet and nice and kind as Valerie could have done such a horrific thing. And they especially couldn't believe that she was capable of chopping up a body. They felt that she was too small and that was too big of a job for someone of her size to do. And a lot of times in true crimes, when somebody has been uh, dismembered or partially dismembered, any of that, Everyone's always like, no, they were too small. There's no way they could do it. But I'm telling you, <laughs> I know of so many cases of very tiny people that were very capable of doing such an act. People were very divided in their opinions of what they thought had occurred. A friend of Valerie's was quoted as saying, she is a very gentle, decent person. And I'm astonished at this. I think highly of Valerie and it makes me sick to my stomach. I know her husband beat her up. I've seen her face 
and it was a sickening thing. So it does appear allegedly that Ira had been physically abusing Valerie and people knew about it. She had bruises and had to work and would go to the salon and friends and clients would see these bruises on Valerie. And during Valerie's interrogation on January 28th, she admitted that she was the person who had dumped the torso in the dumpster. However, she claimed that she hadn't killed him. And it's gonna be hard for me to say this without laughing, but what Valerie told the police was she just came home and Ira was dead on the floor. She doesn't know who killed him. She just walked in the house and he was dead. And her solution was to chop him up because she didn't want to be considered a suspect. And I don't know any rational person that comes home or goes in anywhere and sees somebody who has obviously died on the floor and their first thought is, I don't want to be accused of murder, so I'm going to chop this person up. Like, I, I don't, I feel like she could have come up with a better story. <laughs> like, if that's the best story you got, you're in trouble. Like, that's not a good story. That's not going to work. Nobody's going to fall for that shit. <laughs> but even though she admitted to dismembering him, she refused to say where the rest of his body parts were. She also said that she had found the body on January 24th and it was January 28th when the truck driver saw her putting the torso in the dumpster. So there was four days she in between when she said she found him to when she was seen dumping part of him. And she wouldn't explain anything as to what she had done in those four days. And I mean, if we think about it, we know what she was doing during those four days. She was busy chopping him up. If you can dismember a body, there is something wrong with you. There is something not right in your head. So Valerie was arrested and charged with first degree murder. Police also searched the home of Merle Bianchi. And earlier in the story, I had told you that for a short period of time, Valerie and Michael had moved out of Ira's home and moved in with Merle, whose husband had gone missing and was later found murdered. And the police found this a little bit too much of a coincidence. These two friends, husbands, had been murdered just four months apart. And Valerie and Michael were staying with Merle when her husband went missing. Police did test the ballistics of the gun found in Valerie's car against the uh, bullet that was found in Ronald Bianchi, who was Merle's husband, but it wasn't a match. So the gun that Valerie had was not the gun that had killed Ronald. And police did not believe that Valerie could have dismembered Ira on her own. And as I mentioned earlier, this comes up a lot in true crime cases where it's believed that the suspect is too small to be able to do this. And I don't know personally, but I do know that it takes a lot to dismember a body. I know it's not an easy task, I don't know exactly what goes into it and I honestly don't want to know that much about it um, but I do know that it's a difficult thing to do so this caused the police to become suspicious of Michael and his involvement and obviously the police asked Valerie about this but she claimed Michael had nothing to do with anything. Then the police searched the home. In the home they found a saw that had recently been purchased in the last few months, saw blades as well that Valerie had purchased in the last few months. Also the fact that she had taken shooting lessons just a month prior to the murder made the police believe that this was 
an intentional premeditated murder. In other words, this was not self-defense. At this point, Valerie's not claiming self-defense. She's claiming she walked in the house and her husband was dead on the floor. So she just had to do this because she thought she'd become a suspect. Um, but the police knew that this was a very calculated, planned, intentional murder. The police then searched the bars that Ira had owned in Chandler, Arizona, thinking that maybe Valerie had stored Ira's body in the freezer. Like, you know, it was a bar. So they had big walk-in freezers. You could potentially put, you know, those big freezers. People can just walk in, like there's space. And while researching this case, I found out a very odd fact. Apparently, freezing a body can make it easier to dismember. I don't understand why. I would think that it would be harder to do that to someone who is frozen solid. I don't know. But apparently if you freeze a body, I'm not giving suggestions. <laughs> apparently if you freeze a body, it makes it easier to chop them up. But information I clearly really did not need to know. But police still believed that this, that this job was too much for Valerie to do on her own. They really believed that Valerie had to have had help. And I know in this video, I've stated a couple times that, you know, I've heard of so many situations where they say the person is too small to do this. And then you find out somehow they figured out how to do it. But in this case, police really were sticking to the belief that Valerie could not have done this alone. She needed help. And who do you think they think helped her? Mr. Michael Savage. Truth is, I think he helped her too. Cause they were way too close. Like they were really, really close. Because Valerie was French, she was placed on an immigration hold. Meaning that if she was ever released for any reason, she could be handed over to French authorities and be forced to be deported back to France. And unfortunately for prosecutors, there was no blood evidence that linked Valerie to the crime. And the bullet that killed Ira was never recovered. They believed it had been shot into the back of his head. But I don't understand if, if, if the bullet was in his head, why couldn't they go in to take it out. Oh, they never found the rest of him. Okay, so they couldn't match the bullet because they believed it was in the head and they never found the head. Okay, yeah, okay, that makes sense. I was confused there for a minute, but you know, we're not dealing with a whole body. <laughs> The prosecutor was very nervous to take this to trial because they were very afraid that she would get found not guilty because of the domestic abuse that she had suffered. So they decided to offer Valerie a plea deal. After two and a half years of waiting in jail, as part of the plea deal, Valerie admitted she had shot Ira Pomerantz during an argument. She pleaded guilty to the lesser charge of second degree murder with a prison sentence of just 16 years. And Valerie seemed to have a good time in jail. Before she went to jail, she ran a salon and then she went to jail and she ran the prison salon. She would cut the other inmates hairs and she would also cut employees hairs, like employees of the prison. And I found that very strange. If someone is in prison for murder, 
and also chop, chop, chop the body, would you as an employee of the prison want that woman near you with scissors? Because I wouldn't. I found that very odd that she was cutting employees' hair. But I guess that's just what the the prison she was in, that's what they did. I mean, I can understand if you're in prison, people need haircuts, so they have a salon and somebody's cutting somebody's hair. I understand all of that. But when I read that she was cutting employees' hair, I was just like, I don't know. I don't know. Like, I wouldn't want someone cutting my hair, being that close to me, with scissors who had done what Valerie had done. In 2006, she was approved for a transfer to be sent back to France to finish out her sentence. Ira's daughters pressured the Department of Corrections to reverse that move. Because if she was sent back to France, Upon arriving in France, France is under no obligation to force Pape to finish her sentence. So Valerie was then transferred back to Arizona to finish out her sentence, which good thing. And after serving her sentence at the age of 63, Valerie was released from prison in 2016 and deported back to France. So if you're in France, Valerie Pape, she's walking around, just to let you know. That always terrifies me, it always terrifies me. Like I'm Canadian, so we have Carla Homoka walking around, right? So I think maybe we're Canadians are a little more traumatized. <laughs> that just scares me to know the crimes these people have committed and then to know they're just walking around free, doing whatever they want to do. But that's the way it is. You have noticed the title of this video was the Arizona Torso Murders number one. My next video is going to be the Arizona Torso Murders number two. The two cases are not related. They're not related at all. Um, they both took place, they're both very, very, very similar cases, but they're, they're not connected. One th with Valerie, this happened, and years later, there was another case very similar with a lot of very close similarities. So the two cases aren't connected, but check out the next video, because if you thought this was a weird story, that one's batshit crazy. Like, that one is wild. That one is crazy. But just so you know, it's the, this isn't a two part video. It's not a continuation of this story. It's just two very similar murders in very similar circumstances. Both in Arizona took place very close together. But thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a like. If you'd like to see more from me, subscribe and turn on notifications so you'll be notified each time I upload a new video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have an amazing day. 